Hi, Minutemen, and welcome to week three. We're going to be talking about River Valley Civilizations. This is SOL3. So we're going to start with a little introduction here about River Valley Civilizations, and then we're going to get into the study of Egypt. So rivers, this is where civilization is developing. And you think about why a longer river, well, it makes perfect sense when you think about that you need water for agriculture and water is also going to provide source of drinking for you as well as transportation. Water is life. So the first permanent settlements are going to develop, you know, along the rivers during the Neolithic era. And they're going to find fertile soil. The most fertile soil is along the river banks as it kind of spreads out. Each of these river valley civilizations we're going to talk about flood. And when the waters come up over the banks and flood out, they bring that fertile silt to provide gray areas for growing crops. And the first four, the major four ancient valley civilizations are Mesopotamia along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, Egypt on the Nile River, India along the Ganges River originally, and then the Indus later on, and then China along the Wangha River. So this is, if we're looking at a world map, kind of zoomed out, and then you can see we're going to focus on the Eastern Hemisphere, and typically a lot of classes will actually start with Mesopotamia first. I, however, love to start with Egypt because Egypt is often a topic that you are familiar with, and I remember as a young person being super fascinated with Egypt and how cool Egypt was and to study. So we're going to start with Egypt. This is a zoomed in now on our Eastern Hemisphere. And you're going to see a map. You're going to have to be making a map like this as well. And so we can see here that along the Nile River is Egypt. And then we have here, you can kind of see this would be a crescent shape. It's where we get the word fertile crescent. But this is going to be Mesopotamia in this orangish kind of color here, and the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Mesopotamia literally means the land between the rivers, so that's where it was very fertile. And the Tigris, always think about this, the Tigris is on top. That kind of helps me think where it is. And then we have here along the uh, Indus River, and then the Ganges River is here, which will come later. But the Indus River, where everything really started, and this is present-day Pakistan, mostly, and some of India. And then here in China, we have the uh, Yangtze River and the Wangha River. It starts on the Wangha River, and, and then we'll move on to the Yangtze River. And if you look at your dates here, um, China has been, the more archaeology that we discover, it's becoming older and older. But they're all starting around the same time period, around 3500 BC, so approximately 5,500 years ago. Now, we mentioned this already, why along rivers? Well, obviously, they're going to have the richest soil that's going to come, the silt that's going to come from that. And when they flood, they're, they're leaving that fertile soil. And they also kind of help protect from invasion and from nomadic peoples. That's not going to be true in Mesopotamia because they are going to be invaded constantly. All right, so let's talk about ancient Egypt. And this is what's going to be the focus of day one and day two. And then the Fertile Crescent, there are a lot of civilizations there. And so we're going to have to talk about, we're going to have to spend three days kind of on that. Our, and then we will test at the beginning of next week on Egypt and Mesopotamia. So just for a moment, let's remember that we're talking about Egypt is in Africa and that Africa is huge, okay? And that we're only talking about a very small part of Africa for what we're talking about. Kind of where the India is here, this is where... Egypt civilization was, Egyptian civilization was. So when you think about Egypt, in each of these river valley civilizations, we got to focus on what river we're talking about. And so for Egypt, that is the Nile River. Now, the Nile River does something that seems slightly odd. Uh, the Nile River flows north. Now, not very many rivers in the world flood north. But every single river in the world flows from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. And it just so happens that the higher elevation is in the south, and so the river actually flows north. Some people will say that it flows up. Well, it doesn't flow up because up's that way. It doesn't, like, float in the air. Yeah, but it does flow north. And that is something that makes the Nile rather unique. Now, again, all rivers flow from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. It's just the higher elevation happens to be in the south. 
The biggest part of Egyptian civilization was located mostly around the delta. And the delta of any river is going to be your most fertile soil. Now, the thing about the Nile River, and one of the things that makes Egyptian civilization so successful, is that the Nile River is one of the rivers that is very predictable. So they knew exactly when it was going to flood, and so they could pretty much depend upon that. Notice when you're looking at this map that the green, notice that the green areas are very much close to the river. And then these would be near lakes or oases that would be throughout the desert. Because once you get away from the river, you're going to find very desert area. And so all the green, all of the is where the, the agriculture really is happening. And if you notice the cities, that is where they are located. The river is also going to be our distinction between Upper and Lower Egypt as well. Now remember, Upper River, okay, that would be where the river starts, right? So Upper Egypt is going to be here in the south, and then Lower Egypt is going to be there in the north. So again, geography, this is actually like a Google map here, and you can see, like, look beyond, it's desert, and then you can see this very fertile area here. The Nile River today is not as fertile as it used to be because they actually have put a dam on the river and it has made the flooding a little more dependable but the problem is is that it also has changed the salinization like the salt content of the water and made it not as fertile. So Egypt did begin on the banks of the Nile River and the Nile River is the longest river in the world. The largest river is actually the, um, does anybody know, take a moment to guess, it's actually the Amazon and in South America. And again, like I mentioned, one of the odd things is that it flows south to north. Again, it is, it's just basic physics for gravity. It is over 4,000 miles long and it is developing the same time as the Tigris and Euphrates uh, Mesopotamian civilization. And we do know that they traded. We have found archeological evidence of that. The, again, we're looking at two sections. Remember I mentioned that it's upper Egypt which it's in the south because that's the higher elevation. And the Nile Delta, excuse me, is in the lower Egypt. And the Nile Delta is where most of the population was, like Alexandria is there, Giza is there. The famous cities that we know about Egypt are located there. So what happens? So we've got people who are living here, um, and we know that civilization actually probably started around 3500 BC, though we know that around 5,000 people were living here. And Egypt actually unites under a guy by the name of King Menes. And so this is a little stone carving of him. You'll notice as the civilization progresses that their artwork is going to get better. And it, there were two kingdoms, and he actually unites the kingdoms. And this is one of the things that makes him so significant. He actually was the king of the upper Egypt, which, of course, remember, would be in the south. And then he unites it with the Lower Egypt, and he founded a, din a dynasty, and he placed the capital at Memphis, which um, we'll see on a map here in just a, a few minutes. And so he unites them around 3100 BC, and we begin this time period. Uh, we'll start, it's going to be called the Old Kingdom. So when we talk about Egypt, it's divided into three kingdoms. Remember, I told you it was the Paleolithic and everything that they're not so creative <laughs> with their uh, time periods. And so this is the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. And so uh, we'll look at these as we go through. But one of the things that makes Egypt so significant is these pharaohs, these leaders. And so King Menes is going to become the first pharaoh, the first leader of Egyptian civilization. So one of the ways that he united them was he actually had a crown that was designed. And so there was one that was a white four upper and then the lower was the red and then the they wore them together to signify this uni unity so this was a double crown that king Minis wore so his dynasty that he sets up this is an important vocabulary word so a dynasty means that you are passing the power from generation to generation that we're passing it through the families so when King Minnie's son died, then his son took over, and so on down through. This is what a dynasty is. When there's a change in dynasty, that means that maybe a new leader came in and conquered and took over. So a pharaoh was an Egyptian ruler, and one of the things that makes their government unique is that they were a theocracy. And so a theocracy is when you have a ruler who is also a political and a religious leader. So the Pharaoh was viewed to be as a god. Okay, and this girl talk about that 
as we get more into the religion. But in essence, um, they worshipped the the Pharaoh as well. So they were viewed as God kings, had total power. They were to be obeyed. All of this. Their social structure, as we talk about that for just a few minutes as we look at how they were designed, it was literally a pyramid. So meaning that the people at the top, they're the least amount of people, but they have the most amount of power. And at the bottom, they have the largest population, but the least amount of power. This is called a hierarchy. So you can see here you had the pharaoh at the top, then all like his officials, they were called visors. And then you had their soldiers, the scribes, people who are documenting, writing things down, merchants, craftsmen, then your peasants, and then your slaves. We'll talk a little bit later about the Hebrews who became the largest slave population in Egypt. This rigid social structure is going to be an important concept that forms when we start to see civilizations. And we're going to see this in pretty much everybody that we study. So when we think about religion for the Egyptians, they were polytheistic. So the prefix poly means many. And then theistic comes from the root word theo, which means God or religion. So this means that they believed in many gods. And it was very much a part of their daily life. The Pharaoh was viewed as a god. Actually, the idea that Horus... One of the gods actually embodied him. So in, in this image here, you can see Horus there on the right. And so he has this kind of falcon head. Um, he's actually missing an eye, which you're going to learn about Horus's story uh, later in an assignment tomorrow. Tomorrow you're going to do an activity with the gods and goddesses. You're going to get to pick one that you're interested in and research them a little bit more. I'm going to put a little plug in for uh, if you like Rick, uh, you like to read Rick Reardon. He wrote a great book series. It's only three books, and it's about the uh, Egyptian gods. Many of you know about him from Percy Jackson, but his first book series was actually about the Egyptian gods, and it's a really good series. Uh, behind Horus is his mother, um, Isis, who is, she's my favorite goddess. She's the goddess of motherhood, and she has a very interesting story, um, and her husband, um, Osiris, and they had this amazing kind of like romance um, Osiris actually, his body gets cut up into several different pieces and she cries over him and her tears actually form him back together. Uh, but because of that, he does have to remain in the underworld. Anubis is another famous god. He has a jackal head. He's the one that you can kind of see there on the bottom of a lot of these uh, slides. And Anubis is um, the one who kind of oversees mummification, those kind of processes. Uh, Ra was a sun god um, and very much associated also with the Pharaoh. They believe very strongly in an afterlife, and because of that, they did do a lot of pyramids and different things because they felt that they needed to prepare for the afterlife. Originally, their tombs were these very kind of pyramids but then that became a problem because it's like hey here is where we buried all of our good stuff because they believe that everything they buried with them they could take to their afterlife and they um had to preserve the body because they believe that this eternal spirit called the ka would live in you and they had to preserve that so the way they did that was through mummification uh the image is here the top one is the temple to horus on the top and then on the bottom is a temple to ramses So you can see here there's the Sphinx on the left and then the Great Pyramid of Giza on the right. And so there's not really much in the pyramids today. There were these amazing mazes and the people who designed it and slaves were actually buried and closed inside with the pyramids. Well, one of my old like favorite movies is The Mummy, which is a, is a fantastic movie and talks a lot about it, these different ones. The largest pyramid is in Giza. It's a Great Pyramid. Um, originally... There's a lot of different ways. We know that they invented, the Egyptians invented geometry, but it looks like a lot of the building of these were just done through basic slave labor. labor. What they realized, though, is that pyramids were becoming super expensive, and they also, again, were this, like, big sign that, hey, I buried all these things, and so they were tomb robbers. And so they stopped building these amazing pyramids due to expense and then, again, the security risks. The majority of the pyramids were built during the Old Kingdom, which is about 2700 B.C. to about 2200 B.C. 
So let's talk about the process of mummification because, you know, it's super cool and fascinating. Uh, so mummifying the bodies was how they actually would dry out the corpse. And so they literally would take a, a hot poker, like a long metal stick, and then put it up in your brains. They didn't think your brains were important. They believed that all of your thinking resided in your heart. So they put that up on your nose and then pull your brains out. And then they would use canopic jars. So you can see here, this is the god Anubis. And there's the mummification process. You can see these canopic jars. These were jars where they would put your organs. So if you had any money, then you would have this process done. So obviously the slaves and the peasants couldn't afford this, but these were things that definitely anybody who was wealthy did this. A lot of the mummies that we found aren't necessarily pharaohs, but actually just very wealthy people who went through this process. It actually became like a cool thing during the Roman Empire to kind of copy what the Egyptians had done. And they did have all these rituals that they followed using the Book of the Dead. And so you can see here some mummies. Uh, this is a dried out one. You're going to watch a little video about mummies uh, later today. All right, I want to take a moment and talk about some famous Egyptians. And we're going to start here on the left, and then we're going to move right. So we have, the first one is King Tut. So King uh, Tutankhamun, is actually his full name, was very young and actually died pretty young. He was around... Uh, I think 13, 15 when he died. And what actually makes King Tut significant and why people know King Tut is not because he did anything spectacular, but because his tomb was found almost completely intact. And so when archaeologists found his tomb in the 20th century, they found all these amazing things. And so that's actually his headpiece there on the left uh, that was placed over top of his mummified body. And this was a huge deal to find this, and we learned so much about them. So it's not necessarily that he did anything great, but he has become famous because of his tomb. Next, we have Hatshepsut, and Hatshepsut is one of my all-time favorite uh, people in history. She's actually considered by many to be the first important woman in history. She was a woman pharaoh. So when her husband died, she took the throne. Her stepson was not very happy about that, but he was kind of too young to rule at that point. She um, wanted people to take her seriously, and so she actually, um, if you notice that the little kind of goatee thing that's on her statue there, uh, she would wear that to kind of symbolize that she had the power also of a man, didn't want anybody kind of questioning her authority, but she did rule by herself. When she died, her stepson was so mad at her that he actually, like, erased her name through history. And basically, you couldn't find any statues. He had her name carved off of everything. And so it took archaeologists actually finding, made a discovery that we finally realized who Hatshepsut was. And you're going to watch a little video about her. Uh, next is Nefertiti. His name means beautiful one. And she literally is kind of famous because of her and her husband, and I, my mind is going blank. I can't remember his name. But they had this, they were very much in love. And uh, there's a, a lot of like art and stuff that are famous because of her. The most famous though, probably though, at the very end is Ramses II. So if you are familiar with biblical history, this would be the Ramses that Moses uh, grew up near and in his house. And then the one that he asked to set his people free. Ramses ruled for 67 years. He had over 90 kids, obviously not all with one wife. He had many, many women that he visited. He had over 90 kids. About 54 of them were boys. He built more monuments and temples than anyone else. Had this amazing, lasting legacy. All right, so let's finish up with kind of our important facts and achievements about the Egyptians. So as we think about their contributions, obviously they're writing. They wrote in something called hieroglyphics, which are pictograms. And you could see there, there was different symbols like this one that has the end there. This actually represented water. And they say a lot of different symbols. They also had a type of writing called heretic, which is like a cursive. Uh, but that is something that we did not figure out for a long time. And hieroglyphs, we actually couldn't figure out for a long time. We couldn't figure out what everything was. They had meanings and symbols. And they actually developed a type of paper. They developed papyrus, which comes from the reeds that grew along the Nile, and they used that for paper. So how did we actually kind of figure out what it was? Well, Napoleon's soldiers found this fancy thing over here. It's called the Rosetta Stone. Now, it is huge. I've seen it. It's in London, in the, the, the museum in London, a famous museum. And um, it's almost as tall as I am. Like, it is a huge stone. And they found parts of the stone. And what they figured out is that part of it, of the stone, was written in heretic. 
that kind of cursive writing I was telling you, then part of it was written in her uh, hieroglyphs, and the other part was written in an old version of Greek that people could still read. And so because they could read Greek, they basically used it as a code to translate what the rest of it said, and this is how they figured out what hieroglyphs meant. So there's a picture of the Rosetta Stone. You can see the kind of, um, you got the, at the top is the hieroglyphs, then the hieratic, and then the Greek. So they did a lots of contributions for building the monuments. Obelisks are also a very famous one, which are these tall pyramids. For example, the Washington Monument, of course, is modeled after this to show achievement. Uh, they often wrote things on them. Obviously, the Washington Monument doesn't have anything written on it, but it is a symbol of achievement. They developed system of measurement. They developed a solar calendar. They developed medicine, geometry. Uh, they really were very, very advanced. There was one other civilization I'm going to mention quickly here, and this is also Nubia. So Nubia was down here um, in, the, in the south of Egypt, and the Nubians were really a source of slaves and raw materials. There was a time period where they actually managed to conquer the Egyptians for a very short time, but the Egyptians quickly got back control. And so the Nubians are just kind of an interesting uh, people who are kind of within the part of the Egyptian kingdom. Eventually, things end, and they end with the conquering by Alexander the Great, which is going to happen really 3,000 years after they started. Then the Romans would come in, then the Byzantine Empire, then the Arab Muslims would come in, and eventually they would be conquered by the British under imperialism, and they would not become a free country again until the 1950s. So their empire lasts for basically 3,000 years. Uh, and then they will get uh, conquered, and then we will talk about that later. So you may think, hey, you never mentioned Cleopatra, and that's because Cleopatra is during the time of the Romans. So while they're going to get conquered, they will still continue to have pharaohs, and they will continue that line for a long time, and we will definitely be coming back to Egypt. We haven't left it. So this is it ends your notes. We're going to do several activities to learn more about the Egyptians because they are such a fascinating group of people.